Karl Marx was born on the same year as Frankenstein. The book was published. Karl Marx's most famous work, The Communist Manifesto, begins with a famous line that might sound like the monster in Frankenstein. A specter is haunting Europe. A couple of uh, Marx's other most famous lines come in, come in an essay he wrote called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. One of these appears in the collection of quotations in Buchanan Courtyard in the little pool there. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Mysterious statement because it suggests we make our lives, but we don't make the conditions of our lives. I think that's why he speaks of a specter of a kind of haunting, an awareness of systemic social patterns. We talked now about, you know, systemic racism. He's talking, Marx obviously is talking, is interested in uh, systemic economic inequality. But the point he's making here about not making the conditions of your life, we talk about that now in terms of like, demography is destiny, personal is political, that who we are as individuals isn't entirely up to us, but our individual lives are implicated, complicit in larger historical, social patterns that we did not choose, we did not design, but that we perpetuate through the pursuit of our individual lives. So that's the haunting that Marx wants to wake us up to. So making our own lives is one thing, but making the conditions of our lives, deciding what conditions of life we pass down to the next generation, maybe that's actually more what making, what self-expression, liberty, freedom means, happens more on that systemic level than on the individual level. So I actually read this as Marx's statement about why literature is the most powerful social force. I'm not sure he meant it that way, but what he's saying here is that we need to reflect critically on what we do make and what is made for us in our lives. And how do we do that? But through literature, telling stories of particular lives and how this question is negotiated under actual living circumstances. What are self-selected circumstances and what aren't? What, what do we make of the circumstances that we inherit? The other most famous line from the, this book is, all great historical facts and personages and stories, so to speak, happen twice. Um, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. This is what I mean about the importance of literature. We need literature to tell us which is which, to tell us that our story matters and isn't a joke, that keeps us honest about the stories that matter in life. Jens. Homegoing is a novel centrally about the question of the difference between making one's own history and having it made for one. You can see it combines subversively two different genres. A historically realistic novel, paying attention and syncing up with what we know as the official historical record. But at the same time, it gives us something not objective, but deeply subjective, even magical representation of desire, imagination, fear, very personal and subjective perspectives on history. So in this interplay, we're really 
always negotiating this question, who's making my life? Who's making my history? How was my history made for me? And how am I responding to the conditions I find myself in, not of my own making? And how do I make them my own? The novel Frankenstein is one of the most influential works of literature, of culture, um, ever made. <laughs> and it's by virtue of raising this question about what it means to live one's own life under prepared circumstances, not of one's own choosing. Frankenstein gives us a primal myth um, that has evolved into many different literary and pop culture genres that are very familiar uh, to tons of people who've never read the novel, gothic, sci-fi, horror, providing a new language to raise ancient questions about playing God in an increasingly engineered world. And what it means to make your world or have it made for you. The role of patriarchy, and especially now, uh, Mary Shelley's diagnosis of what we call toxic masculinity is remarkably acute. Not to mention, obviously, Mary Shelley's prescience about biotechnology and the question we've been discussing, systemic social violence. As its subtitle announces, Frankenstein resurrects ancient stories addressing Marx's question of who, how to make one's own life. What, it, what does it mean to choose for oneself? The story of Adam and Eve is about the temptation, not just of sexuality, but the knowledge of good and evil, the power to know and decide for oneself what one is doing. This claim to freedom is what makes Satan the rebel angel and the ironic hero of the pious John Milton's great poem, Paradise Lost. Ironic because Milton's intention, Milton's intention is to retell, articulate and affirm anew the biblical truth. William Blake said, John Milton was always, always of the devil's party, but didn't know it because literature is on the side of rebellion, of questioning. We don't read literature for definitive knowledge of good and evil, but like Satan, we read because we question absolute authority to tell us, to dictate good and evil for us. Prometheus, the figure of Prometheus, combines these three levels, giving to humanity, the godlike power of knowledge, of choice, of creativity, of fire. The fire of the dream of freedom, the dream of recreation, of self-making. But the myth of Prometheus is also about suffering like an animal, being total embodiment, being tortured by a bird of prey endlessly. This same basic question is at the foundation of so many popular narratives currently. Am I making my own life or am I living in somebody else's dream? Does my sense of making my own life just make me sort of a cog in the system of some other larger pre-made reality? False, these false reality narratives like Frankenstein or the Matrix also look back to the religious, mythical, visionary, ritual practice of Gnosticism. Gnostic literature like Frankenstein or the Matrix tell us that we're living in a false reality and the text itself for the film is giving us an invitation, an open door, or vision. Gnosticism literally means vision. A fantastical but partial glimpse into uh, the reality that our so-called reality is disguising or suppressing. 
movies have really effectively used this false reality narrative or Gnostic visionary critique to explore the way sexist, economic, and racist uh, ideologies create false realities, that social ideologies of race, sex, and class can create whole reality, a sense of normalcy that's distorted, and that requires a kind of Promethean or Gnostic visionary rebellion. And false reality narratives are central in the stories that we looked at, stories about living in the wrong body living under the wrong name and having a glimpse if not of your the right reality having a glimpse of the wrongness of the reality you perceive that it's distorted that things don't add up indians are falling out of the sky and it's treated like normal if these stories don't tell us how to fix the distorted reality how to escape the wrong reality they suggest it requires transfiguration, self-transformation. Unless the eye catch fire, the God will not be seen. Trial by fire, self-recreation. Prometheus is said to have brought fire. It's the element of recreation, destruction, but also transfiguration, transforming the world, transforming oneself. This is what these texts are offering readers and challenging readers. The reader of the story, Unless the Eye Catch Fire, is finally consumed in this vision of the narrator. Challenge to take that seriously. Take what's at stake is how we read these stories. The narrator of Hopeful Monsters feels her body differently at the end of the story she feels as if she has a tail even though she doesn't she's been transformed she feels like she belongs to a new family even a new species with a tail and that's a fantasy but it's a fantasy of embodiment that we're asked to participate in as readers of that story and this really goes back to Frankenstein. What, what's at stake in the creature is imagining ourselves, imagining a new kind of body that's been eliminated, exploited, or manipulated in the same way that we understand in terms of the systemic violence of racism and sexism and class inequality today. But all of this... Uh, amazing, diverse influence on subsequent culture is not even the most amazing thing about Frankenstein. The most amazing thing about Frankenstein isn't even about the book. It's the fact that it was written, had the story of its composition. It's a commonplace to say that uh, reality is stranger than fiction, and that's undoubtedly true. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's more interesting than fiction. <laughs> fiction is about telling stories that have, you know, useful information to communicate <laughs> that are worth retelling. What makes the story of the reality of the composition, even of such a singularly amazing uh, work of literature as, as Frankenstein, is that they were lives of people that were using literature to invent themselves. In the case of Mary Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, literally using literature to survive, like to invent a life, life for herself as, as a writer, which also turned out to be as the writer of the foundational text of uh, modern feminism. But what I want you to, as amazing as the vindication of the rights of woman is, and we'll talk about it because it relates very much to Frankenstein, is even more amazing that she wrote it. Writing it was a matter of survival, was a matter of self-invention, finding a way of life in a world that otherwise allowed women so meager a chance at survival, at like it, having any sort of life whatsoever. 
Mary Wollstonecraft made a life for herself by inventing a new philosophy and pioneering uh, the kind of sentimental education through literature that uh, we see um, Mary Shelley building on uh, in Frankenstein as well. This is part of the romantic philosophy codified in a famous work, A Defense of Poetry by Percy Shelley, Mary's partner. They weren't to marry till later, but the first edition of Frankenstein was published anonymously. So feminism is a very long-standing form of philosophy that's gone through lots of evolution. It's a form of philosophy like critical race theory. It's good, you could call feminism critical gender theory. It's uh, a necessity in a society characterized by systemic inequality. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's a discursive hygiene in a, a situation of pathological systemic inequality. Wollstonecraft began critical gender theory and, um, with the following claims. Women are rational creatures. That's the main thing. One of the, you know, the functions of critical theory like this is just to point out what we already supposedly believe but are, are not abiding by in practice. Um, so that's the same way Frankenstein works a lot too, is to sort of catch your conscience. Like, wait a second, I'm treating this creature like a rational creature. I'm recognizing reason. This is the importance of de Lacy, the blind de Lacy, who recognizes there is something in your words, de Lacy says to the creature, that convinces me you're sincere. Point number two, ne nevertheless, d um, extreme gender inequality exists physically. Men and women are physically uh, unequal, economically and legally. Indeed, women are at the time considered the property of their husbands. Three, the risk of social exile for sexual misconduct falls exclusively on women, which makes women tantamount to being a slave in many cases. Given all this, the extremity and the brutality, the nakedness of the hypocrisy of the uh, treatment of women at the time, Wollstonecraft argued that valorizing feminine virtues, sexualized gendered virtues of uh, feminine beauty and sensibility masks the problem, exacerbates the problem by making women believe in virtues that actually oppress them. This question of feminine virtues plays a crucial, crucial role in Frankenstein in the story of Safie's mother, who tries to save Safie from a life in a harem as a toy for men. Wollstonecraft's uh, life was uh, extremely dramatic. She had a very abusive childhood. Dad was an alcoholic and a gambler, tyrannized his wife and family. Um, but Wollstonecraft became a governess and opened a progressive girls boarding school for which she wrote educational stories and conduct manuals. She started writing for broader audiences like George Eliot by translating men and writing under male pseudonyms. This, the role of passing as male um, is interesting, and the role of education, the way in which a marginalized class insinuates itself and asserts itself through the dependence of mainstream society on education. Wollstonecraft covered the French Revolution firsthand was one of the key radical writers at the time in English. She was the key voice opposing Edmund Burke's conservative attack on the revolution. Yet she wept at the king. She saw the king's execution and uh, was moved to tears. She wrote an inventive, introspective travel journal about a trip she took to Scandinavia to salvage her relationship with her first daughters, Fanny's father, Gilbert Imlay. 
um, by recovering merchandise he claimed to have lost there. She didn't find his stuff, didn't save the relationship, and consequently tried unsuccessfully to kill herself for the second time. Yet her travel journal was a great critical and popular success, and then she went on to write her two vindications, Vindication of the Rights of Men, Vindication of the Rights of Women, Founding Documents of Modern Social Philosophy and Policy. She died giving birth to Mary because the doctor didn't wash his hands. Before antibiotics, postpartum infection or childbed fever was a common cause of death. Although it was also known as doctor's plague, physicians resisted change in hygiene practices, even after an 1861 study demonstrating the drastic efficacy of hand washing. So Mary was raised by Wollstonecraft's widower, another leading intellectual and radical of the time, William Godwin. And he raised her in his very stern, intellectual, and socially stunted manner. It's emotionally reserved, intellectually formidable, only rarely in conversant with adults and even more rarely with children. In 1814, when she was 16 and he 21, Mary's prim but intensely idealistic life changed with the entrance of Percy Shelley, the radical poet and aristocratic patron of Godwin. Shelley was recently expelled from Oxford for propounding atheism, soon to be disowned by his father and separated from his then wife and daughter, and was fond of tossing bottled poems and finely waxed paper boat poems into the ocean to transmit moral support to the Irish. Mary and Percy consummated their love on Wollstonecraft's grave and then eloped to Europe along with Mary's half-sister Jane as an idealistic experiment in free love, in Percy's mind at least, who encouraged Mary to have an affair with his male friend, although she resisted. In 1816, called the year without summer due to atmospheric ash from the biggest eruption in 1500 years, months earlier in Indonesia, Mary was staying in a villa on Lake Geneva, along with Lord Byron and Claire, who had changed her name from Jane, uh, and was now pregnant with either Percy or Byron's child. It's, uh, there was some uh, uncertainty about that. This uncertain paternity caused Byron to take unusual pride in the child and support her upbringing, which was short. She died uh, before 10, I think, in a nunnery. Um, but this was unique among his legions of illegitimate children um, that bore, Byron took some um, concern for. Allegra. Mary started writing Frankenstein as part of a party game proposed by Byron's private doctor, John Polidori, author of Vampire, which created the modern prototype of the erotically alluring undead bloodsucker. Mythology of vi vampires, of course, are ancient, um, but the modern, sexualized, charismatic vampire began with Polidori. Mary and Percy's son William was an infant in her lap while she wrote Frankenstein. Mary named her child after her father and also dedicated Frankenstein to Godwin. But Godwin, once Wollstonecraft's idealistic ally opposing marriage, refused to speak to Mary until the couple officially married and agreed to pay Godwin a dowry. Percy left a child and pregnant wife in London who would kill herself due to his elopement. William died of cholera at five in Rome before this portrait was finished. Polidori was then already dead by suicide. Percy died at 29 while sailing in a storm, a favorite activity, although he refused ever to learn to swim. And two years after this, Byron died of malaria while fighting for independence and chasing boys in Greece. After that year without summer, when Mary started writing Frankenstein, the Villa Diodati, seen here in the middle, on Lake Geneva, with these sublime 
other dimensional mountain ranges and background. All the residents that summer, that summer in the year without summer, were dead within a few years. Except Claire, Mary, and Mary's prodigious creation, Frankenstein.